Commissioner, yes, I Mr. Denali. wish to call the next witness, uh, Mr. Doherty, Mr. Michael Doherty. Mr. Stapleton, oh sorry, Your Honour, Mr. Stapleton is just joining us at the bar table. Um, he has leave to appear for Mr. Doherty. Yes. Now, Mr. Doherty, uh, you, once we've sorted out the mechanics around you, uh, it'll be a case of whether uh, you wish to make an oath or take an affirmation. Please. Oath, please. Yes. I'll just Yes, if you swear to witness, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the and truth. Nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Doherty. Do sit down. Yes. Commissioner, can you tell the commission your full name, please? Uh, Michael Edwin Doherty. And the commission has your business address. Submitted. Yes. And you have received a summons to appear in the Commission today? Yes, I have. And do you have an original copy of that? Yes, I do. Thank you. I attended that Commission. That will be Exhibit 3. Point. Doesn't sound right. Uh, 3.98 is the summons to Mr. Doherty. Thank you, Commission. And you've prepared a witness statement in order to give evidence today, haven't you? Yes, I have. And that was sworn on Thursday the 24th of May? <coughs> That's correct. 2018. And do you have an original copy of that with you? Yes. And are there any corrections you wish to make to that? No. And is it true and correct? Yes, it is. And I attend to that, Commissioner. The witness you. statement of Mr Doherty uh, is Exhibit 3.99. Thank you. Yes, Mr Dinelli. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Doherty. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Doherty, uh, in your witness statement, you explained that you followed your parents into the hospitality industry. Can you inform the commissioners to your, uh, your background? Yes, I uh, entered my parents. We actually started in a takeaway food store not far from here at Flinders Lane, Melbourne, about 35 years ago. After that, we went through various layers of hospitality. We had a hotel, small hotel in Echuca. Uh, we went up to Cairns, we went through the airline pilot strike. During that period there we extended and um, international marketing into Papua New Guinea and also United Kingdom. We developed a number of properties which are now known as the Siebel and Hawkesbury in Sydney, the Novotel Lawn System, the Australian Wilderness Gallery, properties both in Fiji and South America, and uh, also extensive developments into Tasmania. Uh, and in fact I'd like to ask you a few questions if I may about the development in particular in Tasmania. Mm -hmm. um, before we come to that, um, I understand that it, in about 2006 you became a customer of Bankwest, is that right? That's correct. And how did you come to be uh, a customer of Bankwest? We'd always had a very good relationship with the valuers and real estate agents and we used them for our due diligence in anywhere that we used to go to. And we used extensively Jones Lang LaSalle for corporate advisory. And it was Troy Craig from the Valuations Department that told that Bankwest had an exceptional uh, business banker in the hospitality industry, Darren Longmuir, and would you like to organise a, a cup of coffee between us? And I said, yeah, we certainly would. So that was the introduction to Darren Longmuir. Uh, so you met, well, you were introduced to Mr Longmuir by Mr Craig, um, and then did you um, start banking with Bank West around that time? Yes, around that time we, uh, he gave us an offer, which actually the offer came out within 24 hours of meeting him. Um, it was a very good offer, the rates were very competitive and Darren Longmuir was an incredibly intelligent guy, um, knew the hospitality industry backwards and you know, we felt very comfortable dealing with him. Uh, and your dealings in, this is around the middle of 2007, wasn't it, that you were dealing with Mr Longmuir? Yes. Um, and you, can you explain um, to the Commissioner what the nature of the um, facility that you entered into with, um, with Bank West around that time was? Yeah, we had one facility. It was um, for over three properties, uh, Lura, Ballarat Lodge and Hadley's. And we're currently dealing with Westpac and they offered to buy the Westpac debt out. 
and change over the securities and the offer that they put forward, the margins, which are so good we couldn't turn it back. I'm sorry, you said that there it was secured by some properties. Can we just go back a step? What were those properties? It was Lura Gardens Resort, Lura in Blue yep. Mountains, Ballarat Lodge in Victoria, and Hadley's in Hobart. So Hadley's, can you explain um, to the Commissioner, and we'll come to discuss in a bit more detail, what Hadley's um, was and where it was? Yep. Hadley's a uh, very historic hotel. It's the oldest continuing liquor licence in Australia. Um, the hotel... It uh, was uh, 71 rooms. Uh, it was around about a three and a half star. It was a bit run down at the time of buying it, but we had refurbished it extensively to a four and a half star. And at the time of buying it, we also purchased the land called Inner Collins, which is attached to the hotel, fronting Collins Street. And that was originally the Bogues Brewery offices, uh, which they had rented back office for a short period of time. And now it was a vacant development site. But we were using it for car parking in the hotel whilst we're obtaining town planning permits. I see. So when you refer to Inner Collins, can you, um, can you, assist, can you assist by explaining how that related to Hadley's Hotel? Yeah, well, they were, built, they were all uh, next door to each other. Uh, Hadley's fronted Murray Street and the back of Hadley's backed on to uh, Inner Collins, which fronted Collins Street. So it formed a big L shape, um, virtually, of the land, and it had a separate entrance off it from Victoria Lane at the back. And in your evidence, you speak about it around that time, 2007, 2008, what the major um, goal of your hotel group, which I understand is the Doherty Hotels, mm -hmm. if I can call it that just for convenience, yeah. um, what was the major goal um, that they had around that time in relation to, uh, to Hadley's? Well, it was a project that had been in the plan for many years and uh, you know, that was when we made the move with Darren Longmuir. It was always discussed that Hadley's was going to be the, the development which we were planning towards going uh, towards. There was a lot of correspondence between Darren Longmuir, uh, Jones Lang LaSalle, etc. We were planning what the property was going to be like. At that stage, we were wishing to go with the Chisel Now or the Go, a service department model, rather than a motel build. The discussions were around that the service department model had a number of upsides to it. If times got tough, you could sell off a few units. Um, it gave greater flexibility to the valuer because once one unit is sold in the complex, it's a powering value there for it. Downside is to a service department, it's a lot more expensive to build than a traditional 25 square unit motel development. But we thought with the flexibility, then the, this mixed use development was the way we wanted to proceed. So, so that I understand that Hadley's, uh, Hadley's uh, on Murray Street was the hotel. Was that going to remain a Yes, hotel? that was going to remain, and that was under the management of ACOR. And you said that Inner Collins was to become a group of service departments? It was a, a mixed-use development on the ground floor. There was two retail components. There was a first-floor restaurant, which was on a separate strata title. Then levels uh, three, four and five was public car parking. Then it had four levels of uh, service departments. And then the top floor was eight penthouses for residential use, which had big spas on the balcony looking down the Derwent River. Um, how many penthouses did you say? Eight. Uh, and you've used a term there that I'd just like to explore a bit. You said that it was a mixed use um, development. What, what exactly do you mean by a mixed use development? Well, we're putting in a mixed use such as a retail component. Um, the tenant pays the outgoings, virtually all the money that comes in is profit. In a hotel, we'll run traditionally on about 25% turnover to profit. And the apartments on the top floor, they were valued at around $8,000 per square metre. So they had a different use altogether because they would be for a residential uh, component rather than a commercial component. So it was, it was a variety of mixtures as a public car park uh, than just a straight hotel. And one of the other terms that comes up on a number of um, occasions is the concept of in one line. What, what does that mean in the context of evaluation? Well, the in one line valuation that was called for, if we're skipping forward to 2000... I'm just asking about the concept first. We'll come, come to that. But what, 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 what does it mean? In one line is just as one hotel. So you don't take into account the value of the residential apartments. They're valued as a motel compartment, which 
it's strange because a, a motel tr is traditionally 25 square metres, an apartment is uh, you know, 130, 140 square metres, so it has a totally different building rationale because it's built to a totally different market. But if it's put into one line, it's just uh, considered another motel room. So is when when during your evidence and the evidence of others, there's reference to in one line, that relevantly, does that mean... This, um, all of Hadley's and Inner Collins, is that yes, right? Yes, correct. Car park, retail shops, etc. cetera. Uh, now, you've said that it was a, uh, a very large project. Um, you obviously needed funding um, for that. How did you propose to um, seek funding to uh, to, to complete this project? Well, as I said, it was a project that we built up to over a number of years. We sold the Lura Gardens Resort um, before we entered into it. And then you know, there was a considerable amount of town planning that had to go in because it was a big project in, in Hobart. And you know, a number of consultancies and all that time, all correspondence was always between... We had a very good relationship there with Darren. You know, and nothing was done as by surprise it was you know everything was planned because it was always the goal we we're heading to um, and i'll ask you about a number of valuations during the course of your evidence um, perhaps i can take you to identify at um, med2 rcd.0024.0013.0001 thank you the operators um, correctly predicted those numbers, thank you. Um, this is a valuation report which was obtained by, from, I'm sorry, Knight Frank in December 2007. Um, can you explain to the Commission why um, this valuation was obtained? Yeah, this was a valuation to uh, pick on the feasibility of the project um, going forward. It was commissioned by uh, Bank West. Uh, Bank West appointed Matthew Page, who is the head valuer for Knight Frank Tasmania, to do the uh, valuation. Uh, and uh, had you dealt with, um, with Mr Page beforehand? Uh, we'd had dealt with Matthew Page, yes. He was the panel valuer. I see. And if I can go to the third page, point zero 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 three, um, there's a reference to various uh, <coughs> uh, to various components of um, of of the project, mm -hmm. um, and it's valued ultimately at sixty million dollars. Yep. Was that a valuation as at that time, or as at the completion of the? Development. That was when the development was being proposed going forward and that didn't include the penthouses on the top floor at that stage because they were a later thought, but that was the development on completion. I see. And you wanted to borrow, if I'm right, or your companies, um, your family companies wanted to um, borrow um, ultimately $50.2 million, didn't you, to do... Yes. This development, that is to say, to re for the actual facility as well as the costs of the construction. That's correct. Uh, and when you um, went to Bank West, they they wanted to do um, a a check valuation, didn't they? That was right. It was a few months later because it took a while to get all the planning approvals in place. So I think the one we've just been to that Mr Page of Knight Frank performed was in December 2007. Mm -hmm. The next one, um, before I come to it, the next one wasn't prepared until August 2008. Why was there... That was just about... during the town planning process to get I before see. we got ready to get built, ready to build. And, uh, and can you explain to the Commission why it was necessary to get a, um, a further valuation that period of time later, that is to say 10 months or approximately 10 months later? I think it was just the, so this was a big development, no one was hiding that and they said that they'd like to get a check valuation done on it and they proposed that it be done by Peter Grieve who is the head valuer Asia Pacific for CBRE. And so I can go to that valuation at um, MED3 
Is this the valuation to which you're referring? Yes. Uh, and <coughs> did you have any discussions with Bank West at that time about who who should perform that valuation? They told me that they considered there was a conflict of interest with Troy Craig doing it because they brought up that Troy Craig was actually paid a commission to bring us in as a client at Bank West, which we didn't know of at the time, but we later got that confirmed by Troy that he did he was paid, seconded to bring us in as a client. But you wouldn't have had any difficulty with Troy valuing the property at that time? No. And perhaps if I can go to um, one particular part of um, uh, of this valuation at 0.4984. Um, so you said previously that it was Mr Grieve who, uh, who performed the valuation. In, in your experience, were there many people who could perform these valuations at, at, at the relevant time in Tasmania? Well, they're all tier one valuers um, and all panel panel valuers. The main valuers in the country is Jones Lang LaSalle, CBRE and um, Knight Frank for this sort of hospitality venture. I see. And Knight Frank had already given a valuation. That's correct. Uh, and perhaps we can blow up this little table here. This was just to assist... Um, just to assist the Commissioner in terms of these values. Uh, there's a reference to the hotel valuation uh, as is, um, $15.2 million. What does that refer to? That is the original Hadley's Hotel in Murray Street, which is the 71 rooms, the heritage property. I see. Uh, and. Uh, and then there's also um, uh, there's also um, a reference to as if complete valuations. Can you assist me with what's meant by Hadley's and Collins Street in one line? Uh, that would be the Hadley's and Motel, as the just built as a, sold as a hotel. So if uh, so, if you sold Hadley's, the older hotel yep. that's been there for. 150 years, yep. um, together with your development or the Inner Collins, yep. um, it was Mr Greaves view that um, together in one line they would sell for, that they would have a value of <coughs> 3.5 million, is that correct? That's correct, not taking into account the various components. Okay, and what about if you took into account the various components, what, um, how would it differ? Well then you'd be looking at uh, the... Um Collins Street, which is the gross real size of the blades, including level eight, yes. at forty nine million. Yes. Plus the Hadley's valuation at fifteen point two. So if my maths is um, if if my maths is correct, it would have um, then led to a, um, a combined value of sixty four point five nine million dollars. That's correct. That right? Yes. So. The sixty four point five nine was on the basis that. Uh, the parts of the development were sold separately. That is to say, you'd sell Hadley's and you'd sell the mixed-use development in a separate parts. Is that right? Yeah, sell them or take them into account of what they are. Yes. Um, and conversely, in one line, was if they were to be sold um, as a whole. And disregard the various other entities, yeah. When you say disregard the various other entities, what do you mean by that? Well, you wouldn't just wouldn't take into account that a residential house is worth seven hundred thousand. You just put it in as a motel stock, I see. value it at whatever a unit is. You know, one hundred eighty, two hundred thousand. I see. Now, soon after, so we can take down that um, valuation now. Soon after you, did you receive a copy of that valuation, Mr. Dolly? Yes, we did. Um, who provided it to you? Out of the bank. Um, and you, in your evidence, you say that you had a discussion with Mr Longmuir about it soon afterwards, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, and what, what 
did you discuss with Mr Longmuir about the CBR evaluation? Remember, one particular thing, as Darren said, and it came up later in the conversation, he said, well, it is what it is. He said, it's a mixed-use development. It's got to be valued accordingly to it. Um, and Darren Longmuir, with his, he's a very intelligent man, he understood the industry, he said, of course it's got to be uh, what it is. Uh, and perhaps if you can just assist me in relation to that, just to break that down, it is... What, what was he suggesting by ref when, he said, when he said that, or what did you well, understand? When he said it is what it is, he said, like, the retail is not a hotel. The public car park is not a hotel. And the residential penthouses that will be sold off as residences are not a hotel. So he said, we value the hotel as a hotel, and we value the other components as what they are. So when you say when he when he referred to we, he was referring to Bank West. Is that right? We he's Bank West. Yes, he was, he was representing Bank West. Uh, so what what relevance does the difference between the two valuations mean for what? for the money that you wish to borrow from Bank West to do the development? Well, we had a, a loan, the loan approval had a covenant in there that wasn't to exceed 65%. So now, just ex stopping there, what, what do you mean by not exceeding 65%? Well, when you took the two valuations of Ballarat and, Lure, uh, Ballarat and uh, Hadley's, combined them up, the valuation ratio was not to exceed 65% of the total amount borrowed. So the loan to valuation ratio yes. wasn't to exceed 65%. That's right. And when the equation was done, it's all in one line, it did exceed 65%. But when it was done as the mixed use, it came down to very close to 60%. So that was why... It, uh, accepted the valuation, as Darren said. Well, we don't have to change anything because it falls within the it falls within the guidelines. Uh, now, perhaps just to explain that, and is, there is some complexity to it. Um, can I t go to WIT, um, which is your statement? If I can kindly have called up WIT.0001, and perhaps I can go to. Um, point zero 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 six. Now you referred to various properties which is the Doherty Hotels Group own, but at the time you had the Grand Mercure in Ballarat. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and in your statement where you refer to the Capital P property, that's a reference to both Hadleys and Inner Collins. Is that right? That's correct. Um, what? Is in paragraph 23, can you explain what you're seeking to explain well, there? What we're doing there is we had this loan to value ratio that it was capped at 65%. If we took the Ballarat valuation and the Hadley's valuation in one line, it came out at 73.5 million, which had an LVR covenant of 68%. So we would have been outside our covenants before the building ever started. So that is. When you say outside your covenants, what you're saying is that you would have breached the LVR ratio, would have been more than 65%. Before, so, however, if we took the Ballarat valuation and the Hadley's valuation as a mixed use, it came in at 84.59 and it brought us in at an LVR at 59%. Now, at that point, Darren Long, you made the point we don't have to go back to credit to get any further approvals because you're inside your covenants comfortably. And when he said that, you understood him to be referring to an analysis of the type that you've just explained to the... Yes, well, we did that same graph uh, with him as we were working with him very closely and clearly it showed, you know, one, one it doesn't work out, one it does work out and... Um, and that was where the phrase was used so many times, it is what it is. And the valuation was obtained in this, that valuation which we've been referring to and which is reflected there, was obtained in August 2008. That's correct, yeah. Uh, and then it was soon after that, in fact, it was in September, was it not, that you entered into the facility agreement? That's correct. And... Perhaps I can um, sort of summarise the main terms of that and you can tell me if I've um, erred in any way. But 
what was intended by the facility was that it was in, to incorporate the previous loans uh, and also the construction costs, or, which we'll, we'll come to describe as um, tranche two. There was two parts of the loan, is that correct? That's correct. So tranche one was the commercial advance for $23.5 million, is that correct? That's correct. And a second commercial advance for the development of the property was for $27.2 million. That's correct. Um, and pausing there and returning to your statement, that's where you get to the 50.2, is that, that correct? That's correct. Did, were you advanced that, or how was it that you would come to be ad, advanced the $27.2 million, the tranche two funds? Uh, that was for the building cost. And so you didn't receive them at that time? It was no, over time. Uh, a, the bank uh, appointed Napier and Blakely as quantity surveyors for the building. And uh, each month when the builder would put into a, the bank also requested that Napier and Blakely be the site superintendent. So that way the project was managed. Uh, each month when there was a, a builder's meeting, the Napier and Blakely would certify whether the costs were accurate and put the uh, costing into the bank and then the bank would release that money to the builder. I see. Uh, and returning to the terms of the facility, interest was payable on tranche one, is that right? That's correct, um, that's correct. Um, but the interest in respect of um, tranche, tr tranche two could be capitalised as long as the facility didn't go into default, is that right? That's correct. Um, now, because Doherty Hotels no longer own Lura Gardens, mm -hmm. the security um, in a Collins and Hadley's, that is the, the property that we're talking about, as well as Ballarat, is that right? That's correct. Uh, and I've already referred to the fact that there was a loan valuation ratio of 65%, or you've given evidence about that. Mm -hmm. And that was ultimately agreed in the form of a, uh, a facility agreement, wasn't it? Yes, that's correct. Um, and we won't go to its terms, but it's... Um, the document which you have in your statement at MED4. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr Doherty, can you explain when you understood the facility um, to ex was to expire? Yep. The we took we the facility was taken out, I believe, to 2013. We had detailed discussions with Treasury and it was also hedged to 2013. That's for trenches one and trenches two. We were explained that trenches number one was written straight to 2013. Trench number two was written at the expected completion date of the motel. Then it would be repriced as building is always a dearer pricing than what uh, normal long-term debt is. And then it would all be rolled into the one facility. But with Treasury, we, we discussed you know, will matters, implications, it was quite a lengthy discussion and we all came to the mutual idea that we should hedge the entire debt out to 2013. And when you refer to Treasury, what's that a reference to? That was Bank West Treasury. Uh, and what did the hedge involve? The hedge involved taking an interest rate mitigation program. So we bought swap deals, I think they call them, but it was a, a facility so that if the interest rate went extremely high, we were high, we were covered. If the interest rate went below uh, what we had hedged it, we had to wear the loss on it. But it was, it was something which we and the bank, we all thought, given the size of the loan and the long-term commitment we were all entering into, that it was prudent. I see. And the last, or the, the last a aspect of the facility agreement I wish to deal with is this. Did you also um, give, personally give a guarantee? Yes. Uh, and did you sign that guarantee at the same time that you signed the facility agreement? Uh, would have, yes. Is that an appropriate time? Is how long do you expect to require to complete? To I'll, I'll probably be at least another half an hour to 45 minutes. And I'm sorry, we'll have to ask you to return at quarter to ten tomorrow morning. That's okay. I'm here. Nine forty-five. It is tomorrow.
Yes, Mr Donnelly. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Doherty, yesterday afternoon we arrived at the <coughs> point where you'd just signed the facilities um, and the facilities were in place. You'd offered a guarantee uh, and I understand that then construction started soon after. When did construction start? Construction started about January, February of 2009. Uh, and, um, and who... Uh, who were the builders that had been engaged to do the... Build, the, the um, builders were Hinman, Wright and Mansur. They were a division of guns, and that was, again, through consultation with the bank because they were the only builder that had experience in high-rise construction in Tasmania. I see. And the construction proceeded during 2009? Yes. Uh, and you made um, your whatever interest payments were necessary? Yes. And... Um, there were some amendments during 2009. I'm not going to go to them in the interests of time, but if I can summarise them, um, am I right that there was an addition of a new security property during 2009? That's correct, yes. And what was that security property? Uh, that was the Man of Ross Hotel in Ross, Tasmania. I see. Uh, and is it also the case that there were some amendments to the, uh, the amount um, of the tranche to funding? Yes, there was, there was confusion there from the start from the bank's perspective because they weren't sure whether they approved 28.1 or $29 million. And when we pointed out to them the correspondence of the emails, it was actually the full $29 million amount. I see. And 2010, you've spoken about in, in some detail in your statement. Uh, can you explain um, to the Commission uh, what... Um, what happened during 2010 with the management of your account? Um, we went from an extremely great uh, business manager who understood the total building scenario uh, across to another gentleman, Martin Waller. And when we got there with Martin Waller, we were starting to getting very concerned. There's a couple of instances which really concerned us. And one of them was that um, there was a comment made that the 2009 figures, June, that there was over a $5 million loss. And their own in investigating accountant pointed out to them that it was actually a $3 million profit. And our chartered accountant, Alex Stevenson, from William Buck in Melbourne, spent six hours over two days explaining to Mr Waller how to read a set of chartered accounts and the differences that there were within the accounts. So we were starting to get very concerned at that level. You mentioned an investigating accountant. What do you mean by that? The bank wanted an investigating accountant appointed, and they appointed uh, Nick Codling of Triple Three, which is a division of Quartamentha. And uh, and who who relayed to you that uh, Mr Codling was going to be appointed as an investigating accountant? Martin Waller uh, initially said that the concerns over the June 09 accounts and uh, the, using phrases like the worsening economy, etc., that he wanted to that we had to appoint uh, the accountant. We did express to them, look, why, you know, this two, $5 million loss is actually a $3 million profit. We went through all the reasons as why the accountant should be employed, and Martin made quite comment to me, which was pretty damning one day. He said, look, if you don't do it, we'll do it. And what involvement did you, uh, did you personally and, and or members of your staff have with Mr Codling at that time? And Nick Codling was a... He's quite a smart man. We got on with him very well. He he understood the accounts, um, which was different to what Mr Waller did. He actually offered to liaise to help Mr Waller get over the, the problems of not understanding uh, the set of accounts. Um, and in his report, I think page 14, he identified where the, the bank had misunderstood the situation. But our chartered accountants during that period of time were asked for enormous copious amounts of reporting to be done in excess of the facility guidelines. And over the period of 2010, 2011, we had run up an additional $526,000 in chartered accountants fees for just continual remodeling and explaining to uh, Mr. Waller in particular how the accounts were put together. Mr. Uh, Codling from 333, who'd um, been appointed um, by the bank as the investigating um, accountant, um, who paid his fees? We had to pay his fees, and they were over $200,000 again, which came out of our money. Um, and there was also involvement around this time um, of someone else 
um, at Bankwest. Who was that? At that stage, then, we were introduced to Jonathan Clements, who was the head of CAMS. OK. And um, how did um, Mr Clements come to be involved in the, the management of, of your account? Um, well, uh, Martin Waller used the phrase once... Um, Again, he got back onto this supposed loss of $5 million and said, look, it's going to have to be handed to the bank's intensive care department. I see. Uh, and, uh, and is that what led to Mr Clements becoming involved? I believe so. Uh, and Mr, uh, Mr Codling prepared um, some reports. Did you see any of the reports that were prepared by by Mr Codling? Uh, yes, we did, but the copy that we had, there were seven pages missing out of it, and the bank refused to give us those missing pages. Now, in 2000, at, towards the end of 2010, you also received a letter from the bank. I might call it up, if I may, um, rcd.0024.0013.019. Do you recall this uh, document, Mr Doherty? Yes, we do. And if you go to the second page, um, there's a schedule of um, revised conditions. Can you explain what, uh, what effect that had on your facility? Well, that was a... Uh, putting up the interest rate, which again drew cash uh, that we had to finish the building uh, out of our lines, so it was a, a cash grab. Did you did you question did you question why? We certainly did. We took it up with uh, Jonathan Clements, and we said, "Well, look, Jonathan, what do you base creditworthiness off? What's the interpretation of that? We've shown you that we're inside our LVR. We've shown you we're inside our interest rate cover." the valuations we're all comfortable with, what is the actual determination of the word creditworthiness? Jonathan Kremitz uh, had a very arrogant attitude and just plussed us off by saying, it's a credit issue. And were you given any other explanation no. at the time? Um, and what effect did, um, did the payment of that um, interest have on well, you at this time? <clears throat> well, all the time it was drawing our cash flow, you know, down and down between that, the Nick Codling report, the in continual request for additional accountancy outside of the facility agreement, and um, was just those professional fees were, were crippling us. Can I return to the question of valuations, which you've um, referred to um, already in your evidence? You had, uh, or you had two valuations completed by Knight Frank in 2010, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, now, again, I won't go to them, but there was one in May 2010 and a later one in December 2010. Mm -hmm. Starting with um, that which was provided in May, can you explain how uh, or why um, that valuation was obtained? Yes, we're, we're getting exceedingly worried by the commentary that was coming back from the bank and that the commentary was coming back was totally misunderstanding the account. At the time, our Director of Finance was Harry Kelly, who had 34 years as an investigating accountant with the Commonwealth Bank and finished his career as Senior Investigating Accountant in Credit Department. So Harry understood the bank procedures and the notion. So Harry said, look, I think we should take the bull by the horns here, get a valuation done so as we can show it to the bank. But we've got to do it in consultation with the bank. So we liaised with Nick Codling. We gave Nick Codling Matthew Page the valuer's details. They had new numerous discussions between themselves, but we thought that was the best way to show if there is a doubt of creditworthiness, let's get it defined and sort it out. And we thought it was easier to take the bull by the horns that way. And, and you ended up getting a valuation in, uh, in May. That's correct. Um, and that, was that provided by Mr Page of Knight Frank? That's right. He was also a tier one valuer and on the bank's panel. Uh, and um, am I right that the valuation that, that was um, prepared was uh, led to a value of or a valuation of sixty seven point seven five million dollars. Is that yes, right? That's correct. Um, and um, that valuation, I can take you to it if it would assist. But that valuation did proceed on the basis, did it not, that at least 
part of the, the assets were to be sold together. Is that right? It was, it was on the asset, but he took apart the revenue streams as different. So retail component was different, car parking was different. So the revenue streams were analysed in a different manner. I see. Yet, but you still went back to him for a further valuation later that year, the one I referred to previously, December 2010. Um, why did you get a further valuation well, from him? Again, the, the rhetoric which was coming out of the bank was misunderstanding. Uh, there was a comment made uh, by the bank, and I notice it's on uh, Peter's affidavit 34B, where the bank couldn't understand the valuation. And Harry Kelly pointed it out to us. He said, look, the bank has these resources, Michael. The bank has these. He said, if the relationship manager doesn't understand and can't comprehend evaluation, he should go for help rather than just leaving it there. So again, we offered to say, as a further confidence to the bank, we'll pay for another valuation and again, be in full consultation with the bank. Things that had changed is that we were starting to get some very significant pre-sales on the building uh, for the unit development. And uh, we were also negotiating with Mantra uh, Group for them to come in. So at that stage, we thought we had a much better picture to show and we wanted to share that with the bank in, in a transparent manner. And, uh, and that valuation, uh, and that valuation came out, if, um, as I understand your evidence, at um, $75.317 million? That's correct. Um, and can you explain, you referred to some uh, matters about pre-sales, et cetera. Was it, it was still the same properties, though, that were being valued by Mr Page on the second occasion, weren't they? Yes, it was. And it, it gets back to the earlier part of a statement in the due diligence that we did with the project and with the bank, where we considered that the wisest way to go forward was to actually do it on a strata title unit basis, because you can sell some of the units down and uh, you know, retrieve some cash flow in should times get tough. And given the, the misunderstanding rhetoric that was coming from the bank, we thought this was an ideal time to, to consider that option and start looking at selling some of the units down. So is that, so do I understand that to be the explanation you gave to the Commission yesterday as to the, um, the, the method of valuation? Yes, yes, because it was a, the, the property had different spectrums and different avenues of sale. Now, just to be clear though, these 2010 valuations, they weren't requested by the bank, were they? No, they were. They, it was when we thought we were getting extremely concerned by the bank's misunderstanding of the polio and, and the rhetoric that was coming through. We said to them in all cases, it was very transparent. We said, look, we'll pay for the valuations. You instruct them, you, or you speak to the value, it's Matthew Page, He's involved with the pre-sales, Knight Frank, so they have an understanding of what the real market is and, and what the sales are. Nick Codling spoke to them on numerous occasions uh, with how the sales were going, how the um, valuation was to be formatted, and it was to bring some common sense to the situation where if the bank was, in particular Nick, um, Martin Waller, was having problems understanding the file, we can sit down, work it out and see what, if any, there is a problem? Because the underlying security is just getting better. <coughs> now, if I can move forward then to the end of that year and, and remaining on the question of valuations, um, you were told, were you not, that you needed another valuation? Uh, not in 2011, we needed another valuation, I yes. See. Um, you refer in your statement to a discussion you had with Mr Longmuir? Yes. Uh, and when did you have that discussion with him? Darren Longmuir um, had always been you know, not supportive. He was a great bank manager. He understood what he was talking about. He was no longer so, on your file, though. No, but we statement. still kept in touch with him. Um, uh, not regularly, but, you know, we still kept liaising with him to see, look, you know, how's everything going? He was interested in our case and uh, we valued his support. Uh, and... You had well, one of those discussions, those infrequent discussions you referred to, you had with him around this time? 
Yep. In one of the discussions in early 2011, we were, the building was coming to a close. We were getting very short of cash through to all the additional expenses that the bank was piling on us and, you know, additional raised interest. But I said to Darren, look, when it's finished, what, what are we going to do? And he said that he had spoken to the head of business banking and that we would be welcome to come back to the banking, uh, business banking department uh, on completion of the building and it, uh, management rights being assigned. We explained to him that we couldn't deal with Martin Waller any longer because without being cruel to the man, he just didn't, it was out of his league, uh, this depth of file. And he said, no, he would apply to see whether it may be himself, but if not, he said it would be a responsible business banker who's used to this level of transactions. Uh, and did you discuss with him um, a further valuation at that time? He said on com- they'll have to have a valuation now for on completion for it to come back to the business banking sector. And he would liaise with Nicole Taglatieri, who was in the business banking department, uh, or, or sorry, the credit asset management department, who was an assistant to Jonathan Clements and Michael Hogan. And did you subsequently have discussions with... Um with that person? Yes. Well, then um, Nicole and uh, she copied in Michael Hogan said that they'd like to have Troy Craig of Jones Lang LaSalle do the valuation. We did query it. We just said, look, we thought there was a conflict of interest because Troy had been paid a commission to second us to the bank. And uh, they said, they came back to us and said, well, it won't actually be Troy, but they still want Jones Lang LaSalle to do the valuation. And we said, we had no objection to that. Later, uh, Michael Hogan um, was dealing with the valuation and we, at that stage, thought that Michael Hogan was an employee of the bank, but then found out he was a director of PPB Advisory, an insolvency group, um, wearing you with a bank's business card, and um, which again worried us in that position. But so we, he said that the valuation would have to be all in one line. And Just stopping there, I mean, you referred to Mr Hogan, but uh, um, in fairness... He he was seconded to the bank, though, wasn't he, at, at that time? You now know that to be the case? Uh, yes, we, we looked at his LinkedIn portfolio and saw that he was a director of PPB at the time. Uh, and was he... Uh, you were dealing with him and with um, <coughs> Ms Tartaglia um, at that time, is that's, that right? That's correct. Jonathan Clements very rarely spoke to us. It was always through uh, Nicole or Michael. I see. And at this stage, was Mr Waller um, involved in the management of your account? Well, it was it was run by them, but occasionally you'd get a, a, an email out of the blue from Martin Waller, of which we got one in January 2011, and he said that approximately we're $2.2 million short to uh, finish the project, and what were we going to do about it? And the bank reserved its rights to not continue on with progress payments. And we, were, we panicked when we saw this and we contacted Nick Coddling at Triple Three and he explained to Martin Waller, no, there was enough money in the facility. Mr Waller just didn't understand the facilities. Can I return to the valuation um, that was obtained at this time? Um, what? And I'm placing this, I think, at about March 2011 when Mr Tartaglia... Um, called you to inform you that Mr Craig, that is Troy Craig of Jones Lang LaSalle, would do the valuation, is that right? That's correct. Um, and on what basis, or were you told at that time, how the valuation was to be performed? We were told, I had a good discussion with Troy Craig, um, as we'd used him many times in the past and valued his opinion. And Troy told me that the instructions were quite strict. He had to do them on an industry um, set of figures, which was our initial complaint because we said, hang on, you're not going to take into account the actual turnover of Hadley's Hotel. And also in regards to that, at that time, Simon McGrath, the chief executive of Acor Asia Pacific, the world's biggest hospitality group, wanted to get involved and he offered to meet the bank, which he did, and he also offered to meet Troy Craig and discuss the projections that he had set forward for the trading of the hotel, because they were quite confident to go forward. He also uh, said that it had to be valued all in one line, taking in no regards for the retail, the apartments and the public car park. 
he explained to me, he said that was a specific instruction from the bank, and he also said that his public liability only covered themselves to do all-in-one-line valuations. So if it was going to be a valuation on a mixed-use basis, it was not one that he or his company could perform. Um, can we just take that one step at a time? In relation to the in-one-line um, valuation, you said that they wouldn't value... Um, they, they wouldn't value certain aspects of the development. Can, can you explain that? In, he, he said in it would detail? be just val valued as one complete um, asset. So retail, like retail, would work on nearly 100% of the rental is profit. Car parking, you're probably looking at 75% of the revenue is profit. Rent the apartments was selling you in the vicinity of seven hundred and fifty to nine hundred thousand dollars each, but they would have to be disregarded as apartments and considered a motel room, which he'd be capping a motel room out at around quarter of a million. So instead of valuing them at three quarters of a million, they'd have to be capitalised in as a motel room. So that's when he says in one line, he just had to imagine it. It was one revenue stream. Did you? Well, obviously you've expressed some concerns about this. Did you raise the concerns at the time with, with Bank West? We raised concerns a lot of the time. We sent quite a few letters um, to uh, Nicole, to Michael Hogan, to Jonathan Clements. We also had discussions uh, with them about it. And we also um, uh, raised it in a, a quite lengthy letter to Troy Craig. Um, one of the considerations we also said to Troy Craig was that how can you not take into account the actual trading performance when you're doing evaluation, especially when you've got the chief executive, Simon McGrath, personally wanting to get involved? You, the email um, you summarise, I won't take you to all of the documents, but I will take you to this briefly, just to ensure that I've, um, the Commission understands the way you put your concern. If one goes to MED 16... <coughs> This is RCD.0024.0013.02.2022. Um, is this, I think it's on the, there's no need to go back to the previous page, but I think this email was sent on the 17th of, of June 2011. Is this the email you were referring to in your evidence a moment ago? That's correct. Um, and if you go to the top, um, or the second paragraph of the second page, uh, you summarise, or you, you say there, we are looking at all the options at the moment and considering which will be the best one to go forward with the inner Collins development. I know you are looking at valuing it all in one line, however we feel there is significant value in the non-related key parts of the property, being its strata, potential penthouses, residential retail areas, etc. Now is that, um, is that what you were referring to a moment ago? Yes, that's correct. Um, Was um, was Mr. Craig at the time aware of uh, the other valuations that had been obtained? Um, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> we certainly hadn't showed him the other valuations. It's, that wouldn't be ethically right to do, but we certainly would have discussed the value that we perceive in the different areas. Uh, and um, and. Did you also have discussions with Mr Craig at around this time? Yes. Uh, and uh, and what, what did he say in particular about um, this question of um, there being significant value in other parts of the property? Well, initially, Troy passed it off to one of their other senior valuers and the, the valuation process went on for about five months. In the end, the other valuer declined to do the valuation and then Troy Craig had to get back involved with it and said that he would personally have to do it. 
and we had lengthy discussions with Troy about the methodology and getting Simon McGrath involved and what all the retail we were able to arrange with him appointments with the sales agents that were doing the pre-sales so as you get a full understanding of the uh, market and the conditions. Um, on the next page you say you do actually really refer to one of the early evaluations. I'm not sure if you've provided him a, a copy but um, uh, you say at the top of point zero two one one. There's a discussion about some other right refinancing, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, and it says their value is Peter Grieve. Who's Peter Grieve again? If you could remind. Uh, Peter Peter Grieve is the tier one value panel valuer for Knight Frank. Um, I think it was your evidence yesterday. He was the person who did the. Oh, sorry, Peter Grieve, no, Peter, sorry, Peter Grieve is CBRE, sorry. Uh, the Matthew check valuation Page, in Frank. August 2008, yes, is that that's right? right. Yep. Um, and you say here, we also note from Peter's valuation from August 2008, he valued the Inner Collins development, excluding Hadley's, in one line at $49 uh, million. Do you see that? Yes, at the top. And you go on to say, there that you, um, in the second paragraph, I've attached the extract from the recent Knight Frank valuation that valued Hadley's with the additional food and beverage component exactly as what we are proposing now. Do you see that? Yes. And what was the, by way of summary, what was the difference between the way in which Matthew Page of Knight Frank had gone about doing the valuation with the valuation that was being proposed by Jones Lang LaSalle? Two ways. One is he took into account the trading and the projections by Simon McGrath. And the second one is that he valued it on its individual components because Knight Frank was involved in the pre-sales. They could see the strength of the market and he knew that what they were selling for. And uh, he valued the he knew what the strength of the car park and that it would be, as well as the retail components and the penthouses. So it was valued taking into account each individual aspect of the motel. And you, um, this email here you copied to Bankwest, did you not? Yes. Um, and did you have other discussions over email and um, by phone with representatives of Bankwest there about this issue? There were multiple discussions. It wasn't something we just, we could see that it was set for a doom. It was setting it up and we we're saying, hang on, you can't do it. And on one discussion with Darren Longmuir, I said to Darren, and Darren said to me, so look, let me speak to Nicole and Michael. It is what it is. It's a mixed use. It's always been a mixed use. And that was the last discussion I ever had with Darren Longmuir. He never came back to me after that. Uh, were the, um, and was there ever a, res a response given as to the method that would be used, ultimately be used by, by, Mr., um, uh, by Mr. Craig at Jones Lang LaSalle? Mr. Cray, he said, on one occasion, he said, look, my hands are tied, the instructions are, it must be in one line, and that's it. He said, if I'm going to do it, that's how it's got to be done. Did you, did you pay for that valuation? Yes, we did. Um, and did you, um, did you see it at the time? No, we, um, we refused a copy of the valuation, so I went to Troy Craig, and I later asked him for a copy of the valuation. He said, no, he couldn't do it. And then after the companies were put into liquidation, both the liquidator of Hadley's and the liquidator of Doherty Hotels tried to get a copy of the valuations, both directly or through the courts, and the bank always refused to give a copy of it. Um, so I take it then that, of course, you weren't asked to comment on any of the, um, the matters that you, you've just raised in a draft of the report or otherwise? No. And what were you told about the LVR covenant after the valuation had occurred? We were told there by Michael Hogan. He said that <clears throat> he said that Bankwest no longer had an appetite for this sort of development, especially in Tasmania. He said we'd have to refinance. He said that there's a number of factors, including that the bank no longer wanted us as a client down in. He said the exposure is too big and it's not where we're heading. And he said also the fact that the valuation has come in and you've well exceeded your LVR. We said to him, well, what is the valuation? And he said, look, I can't tell you, but he said, you've well exceeded your LVR. Well, by the time the um, valuation came in, I think the valuation, obviously you didn't receive it at the time, but you had discussions about it. 
um, in about July 2011. This was around the time that the Tranche 2 facility was about to expire, wasn't it? It, it was the building facility was about to expire, but we had already paid for the hedging of the funds out to 2013. Um, why you've you've mentioned about having hedged the funds out to 2013? Why is that relevant to the refinancing? Well, because we had never anticipated that we would have to leave Bankwest, and that's why we took the first trench of the money to 2013. It was always of the opinion that that second trench would be renegotiated on the completion of the building and then just rolled into one. And that's why when we set the loan up with Treasury and with uh, Darren Longmuir, the funds were all secured to 2013. And did you have discussions about, uh, about how you would manage that if you had to refinance with, with someone else? There was no, never any um, discussion about it. It was always that we no, would no, stay I'm now referring to around the time of the, and we'll come to it in a moment, the completion of the development. Mm -hmm. Around that time, did you have discussions with, um, with Bank West about um, moving to another financier? Well, we were told we had to. Um, so we went out and did everything we could, but it was extremely hard with a building that's not completed yet um, you know, to secure refinancing. And uh, we were told we had to go. Um, and at that time, you were also Sorry, if withdraw that. The tranche two was to expire in uh, at the end of July, so that is the construction part of the facility. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's to be fair. The company was struggling at this point to have enough money to um, to meet its commitments and to get the you know the project over the line. Is that a fair? Look, we were, because, because we were, the project gone longer. We paid out the, all the money to additional professional fees, higher interest bill, and the accountancy. We were running short of money. There was no qualm about that. But we could still see the project coming to an end, and we had negotiated at that stage with uh, Seville Hotels Mantra to come in as the manager of the tower, and that was going to be marketed as Peppers of Hobart. I see. Uh, and if Peppers was to run... Um in a Collins, which is a term I've been using, or the tower, mm -hmm. um, had you had discussions with them um, about a management agreement? Yes, yeah, certainly. With They were coming in on a 30-year management agreement. They were paying $3 million key money at the beginning on uh, taking over the property. Of that $3 million is we had an outstanding liability to the ATO of $1.2 million, and they entered into an agreement, a payment agreement with the ATO that they would pay out of their $3 million uh, settle our ATO debt. Now, the ATO debt was for money for importing goods from China uh, for the development, and that's where you know, the GST had not been paid on it because we'd spent it on all these other uh, professional fees, um, and that was where they were lined to come up. But to, for a mantra to settle, we needed a tripartite agreement, signed a non-disturbance agreement between the bank ourselves and the company uh, Mantra, uh, which is Peppers, for them to come in and operate the hotel. Uh, thank you. you. There's a number of issues that you just raised. Perhaps I can summarise them in this way. Am I right then that in the middle of 2011, uh, you've said that the, the, the company was having cash flow difficulties? Yes. Uh, and there was a debt to um, the tax office of about $1.2 million? Yes. Uh, and you were in the process of negotiating uh, an agreement with, with Mantra to manage um, the service departments? Yes. And you referred to uh, the fact that there needed to be a tripartite agreement mm -hmm. um, with Bank West. Mm -hmm. uh, was that negotiated with Mantra and Bank West at the time? Yes, it was in negotiations. Uh, and you refer in your, uh, you produce in your statement, and I won't go to it, um, at MED 21, um, a, a document, a payment agreement in relation to Pepper's Hotel. Mm -hmm. Is that the agreement that, to which you refer, by which Mantra was going to pay $3 million? That's effectively correct. on signing the management agreement? That's correct. Um, and... <clears throat> Uh, and those funds were going to be used, again, summarise what you've said, those funds were going to be used to pay the tax office mm -hmm. uh, and 
What other expenses did you have at that time that would have to be paid? We had paid the you know, builder who did the final works on the construction site, Voss Constructions, which was about 500000 to bring it up to Pepper's standard because it was all ready to open. And we'd also uh, knock out the business overdraft account. Uh, and when was the uh, when was in a in a Collins able to be occupied, or when when could Mantra have taken over? There was a certificate of occupancy granted on the eleventh of August. Um, I know in Peter's comments saying there's no certificate of completion, but we we don't know. What a there's no such thing as a certificate of completion. A certificate of occupancy is issued by the relevant building authorities to say that the property is fit for accommodation, ready to go into. So it was. they had also had their manager down there. They had their key staff on site. Um, Who's they? Sorry. They was Mantra. Uh, yeah. Their general manager for the hotel was there. They'd advertised. They had their department heads. They were starting to fit out stores. The only thing in the hotel as well as a, a defect of note was that the washing machines that were delivered were top loading rather than front loading so you couldn't lift the lid because the dryer was on top and that had to be changed over. That was the only significant thing that uh, you know had to be changed over and the TVs weren't yet hung on the wall but they were on site. So then uh, we're referring here, you referred to August as being the time when the certificate of occupancy was granted, is that right? That's correct. So from just assuming September then, what was um, what was preventing you opening Inner Collins at that time? Well, Mantra wouldn't go in and open it until they had their tripartite signed uh, agreement um, and they wouldn't pay the amount of money. So the hotel was sitting there ready to trade. We're coming up to Christmas, which is the peak trading time for Tasmania. Uh, we were desperate to get it open and get some revenue uh, stream coming into it. We discussed the issues with Michael Hogan and Michael Hogan said to us, look, we're not going to sign that agreement because if you can't refinance, we will probably want to put a receiver in and um, you know, have it with, sell it with vacant possession. Did you uh, did you have discussions with Bank West or more um, about them signing the the tripartite agreement? Oh, multiple discussions, yeah. Um, and did you you referred then to refinancing? Um, you were trying to find other financing at the time. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Uh, and <clears throat> um, did you have discussions with Bank West about that and about what break fees would be? Yeah, we um, we, we were. Look, everything was pretty transparent. There was nothing hidden. We were saying to them, you're on the phone every couple of days, if not more. And Harry Kelly was in constant contact with them from a credit aspect and knowing the bank's procedures. And we said, look, you know, we've got to get this signed. We've got to get it over the line. And, and we, we're trying to get refinance. And then Michael Hogan parked out of the blue a letter to us saying, well, if you're going to leave us, you still got to pay us $980,000 as a break fee. And we said, well, hang on, you're forcing us out and then you're saying we've got to pay $980,000 as a break fee and I said, that's just made the refinancing impossible. And he said, well, we're not going to release our security unless you give us nine hundred eighty grand." And he put that in a letter. Well, I think you refer to that and it's Exhibit 23 of your statement. Thank you. Um, were you able to seek any other refinancing? Not successfully, no. And um, and at this time, the ATO was pressing for its $1.2 million, wasn't it? Yes. In December, when it got to the point where um, we couldn't... Uh, Peppers couldn't go in and operate the hotel, um, refinancing the, what we thought was going to happen fell over. So at that stage, we contacted the bank again and we said, well, look, we're in this catch. You know, what are we, what are we going to do? We can't refinance it. Um, you know, you, you won't allow the hotel to open to retrieve some debt and uh, pay the ATO off. If that's the case, we'll, you know, have to, we'll be trading insolvently. Um, would they like to recommend an administrator? And we'll liaise with that administrator and put it into voluntary administration, which would have fixed the ATO problem up because they were an um, unsecured creditor. And we could have you know, still liaised in selling the property or parts of the property to retrieve the debt over a structured fashion. And what happened in response to that suggestion? They gave us the name of two um, insolvency companies that we could go to. 
we uh, spoke to PPB Advisory and decided that we thought they would be the best one to, to work with, as Michael Hogan worked for them and he, he knew the liaison of what was going on there. And we spoke to the gentleman in Sydney and he said, look, guys, I don't want to pull the, the pin out from you, but he said the bank's going to appoint a receiver, so you're just wasting your money uh, appointing us. And were receivers then appointed? That day, yes. Um, when were they appointed? Uh, it was in early February 2012. Uh. Also, at that time, we did have a binding heads of agreement from uh, a company, um, and we were negotiating that with Nick Coddling at Triple Three for them to buy the Hadley set of uh, the, the property, which would have retrieved a, a massive part of the debt. Um, and we welcome Nick Coddling to be involved with those discussions so as he could relay that uh, through to the bank. In one regards, it was a fire sale because we knew that a receiver was you know, breathing down our neck. Uh, we had no options. There was, we were push, pushed into a very tight corner. We couldn't pay the extra 980 grand to get refinancing. So the best way was to do a bit of a fire sale ourselves and try and retrieve something out of the ambers. Um, we, we went to the meeting with Cordamentha and we showed them the binding heads of agreement, how it had been done in discussion with Triple Three. And uh, David Witterbottom just said, I see no cash on the table. I see no cash. That's, that's irrelevant. Who was Mr Winterbottom? Winterbottom was the actual receiver, but these elements were, I just don't see any cash on the table. It's irrelevant. Uh, and when the receivership commenced um, in early 2012. Um, did you have any other further involvement in the hotels? Well, when the uh, receiver came in, we, we discussed with the receiver on the day that they came in areas that there was some uh, building defects, which although didn't inhibit the hotel from trading, we thought it was under our duty of care to say that I wasn't comfortable with some of the areas of the fireproofing in the building and that they should you know, get an external consultant to have a look at it, saying it may be right, it may not be right, but I'm not comfortable with some of the work that's been done, even though a full certificate of occupancy and a building permit had been issued. Uh, and to the to your knowledge, what happened then with the um, operation of the hotels after well, the receivers were appointed? Well, that's where it even gets more um, bizarre, if you can say that. Um, the building was built to a pepper standard. There was over $180,000 worth of chandeliers on the ground and conference uh, areas. They pulled all the chandeliers out and embarked on a refurbishing campaign. Now, the hotel had been built to peppers of Hobart standard, and for some reason, the receiver decided that they didn't like the decor. So the chandeliers came out. The cafe had a um, fit out on it of approximately 450000 which was largely altered and thrown out. And the hotel had not traded yet, but was already going through a major uh, refurbish. Are you aware when the hotel um, ultimately opened? It, I believe the works that they did on the refurbishing took them about five or six months, and it opened about May. Um, and you, in the process, during this time, you also you tried to stop the receivers doing various things, didn't you, through court action? We did, and um, we just didn't want the bill to be run up any further. We were still very hopeful that we may be able to put together a rescue deal and, and buy it out. At that stage, David Witterbottom uh, barred me from entering the hotel. He said, and I'd only been back once, he said I was a distraction and critical of him. Uh, and as matters transpired... Um, the property was sold, wasn't it? Uh, the property was sold, yes. And we, you weren't in a position to um, to buy it back? No, unfortunately not. Uh, and then um, thereafter, um, what actions were taken against um, against you personally? Uh, well, then they uh, called in intercompany uh, loans. There was uh, a hotel that we had in Ross, which was our last source of uh, income there, and it was around April. Uh, they said that they were going to... Uh, we wanted to give them 14 days to get out of that hotel um, because of the in they were drawing in all the intercompany loans. We, we expressed, look, we're still in a position to hopefully refinance. Um, you know, we still had some really strong prospects to be able to bring that to the table. 
and they said that they would give us a six-week extension on the basis that we sign a document acknowledging that they'd done no wrong and the bank had acted always in a proper manner. When that was done, we thought it was done totally under duress. We were very stressed by it. We sent copies of that to Senator Williams and Senator Bob Brown, and the feedback we had from them was, look, you've got nowhere to turn. You're being blackmailed, Michael. Just take it, and hopefully someday it'll come up in a later forum. Uh, and <coughs> what steps were then taken um, against um, against you and the other guarantors? Uh, well, we were totally bankrupted and lost houses and the whole scenario. Um, thank you, Mr Dowie. Thank you. What uh, sale price did the receivers obtain for the property, Mr Dowie? <coughs> What sale I, price? I don't know. They never wouldn't tell us. Yes. Ms Collins? Um, Mr Doherty, my name is Elizabeth Collins and I'm um, counsel for the bank. And if I may, I'll just ask you a few very short questions. Yes, certainly. Um, and if at any time you'd like me to show you, show you one of the documents I refer to, please let me know and I'll have it called up. Mm -hmm. um, you recall that Mr Donnelly asked you some questions uh, um, about an email that you sent to Mr Troy Craig, which you were next to your statement on the 12th of June 2011, which you started, we are looking at all the options. Mm -hmm. Do you recall that he asked you some questions about that? Yes. Um, and um, it's right, isn't it, uh, Mr Doherty, that in June 2011, the options that you were looking at included um, selling parts of the Inner Collins development? Yes. And another option you looked at was retaining the whole of the Inner Collins development yes. and refinancing? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's the case, is it not, that you had some discussions in relation to refinancing with Tasmanian Perpetual Trustees mm -hmm. Limited, um, and you had those had had those discussions with Tasmanian Perpetual Trustees uh, by no later than February 2011. Is that right? Uh, um, by no later. Yes. Discussions were on, go, on going right throughout 2011. I see. Um, and do you recall that you in fact put a proposal to Mr. Codling of 333? Uh, in February 2011, um, with and I'll just go through the three elements of the proposal that I want to ask you about. Firstly, um, you would sell levels three and four of Inner Collins and for about seven million dollars. Yep. Uh, secondly, you would um, obtain a loan from Tasmanian Perpetual Trustees of about sixteen million dollars. Mm -hmm. Do you recall that? Yep. Uh, and that would leave um, Bank West's remaining debt at about $30.3 million. Yep. And that was a proposal submitted to Mr Codling on behalf of the bank, well, as agent for the bank in about February 2011. Mm -hmm. um, do you recall then that some months later, uh, you indicated in May 2011, you indicated to Mr Codling that um, you wished to retain the whole of Inner Collins? Yes, in between that there was discussions with Michael Hogan and Michael Hogan made the comment hey, you're not going to sell half the building and leave us with half the assets sold. Uh, we, won't, we won't have a bar of that. I see. Um, so that was a May 2011 proposal. Uh, and then can I suggest to you that by September 2011, um, you had put a refinance proposal to the bank via Mr Codling, um, whereby you would uh, borrow about $24.5 million from Tasmanian Perpetual Trustees, yes. do you recall that? of which you would pay $20 million to Bank West, but you would use the balance, so roughly four or $5 million, in order to fund the costs necessary to finish and open the hotel, correct? And uh, now can you bring that up? Uh, I can, yes. Um, well, can I just ask you this question? Do you, re do you re can you find the document for September 2011? Uh, do you recall putting that proposal or you don't recall If you could that? bring it up, I'd, I'd like to have a look at it. I, I, so it's, I don't have a document from you which records you um, put that proposal, but I can show you a document that's annexed to uh, Mr Clark's statement which was prepared by uh, 333 recording you put that proposal, if that would assist you. Uh, yes, because we weren't uh, given access to Mr Clark's documents. No, no, but I'm just asking you about what you put to 333 and if you yeah. recall putting a proposal... We put effect. everything in writing and if it's in our letter, we put it. But you, is this your answer? You don't recall one way or another whether or not that proposal was a proposal you put? As I mentioned, we had our chart at our Director of Finance, Harry Kelly, who had 34 years as senior IA of the bank, put everything documented. So if it's in his document trail, it'll be there. If it's not documented from us, I'd like to see who documented it. I see. Um, right. 
while we're just getting the document reference, I'll, I'll just come back to that. Um, now, you met, you've asked some, you answered some questions from Mr Delhi in relation to a um, liability to the ATO. Now, that was a liability of the company called Hadley's Proprietary Limited, is that right? What's that, sorry, the... Oh, so I'm sorry, a, a liability of the company Hadley's Proprietary Limited? No, I think it was Hampton Road. I see. Um, do you recall that Hadley's, or I'll ask you this question, Hadley's Proprietary Limited was the registered proprietor of the land on which both the hotel and Inner Collins development sat? No, I think it was KMC Investments. I see. Um, the uh, liability to the ATO was in an amount of about $1.2, $1.3 million. Yes. Is that right? Uh, and that was in respect of uh, GST liability and also PAYG uh, you liability. You said the liability to the hotel, was it? No, no, he no. said the liability to the ATO. Oh, the ATO, was sorry. 1.2 to 1.3 yep. was the question. Yes, that's yes. correct. Uh, and I'm just asking you about the makeup of that liability. Uh, and I'm suggesting to you that the liability comprised both GST liability and also pay as you go or PAYG liability. Do you recall that? Right? I doubt it would be PAYG because the hotel accounts were done by ACOR and as ACOR did the standard accounts for hotels globally and they were due, they were responsible for our compliance. So I doubt it would be PAYG. Um, could I ask, please, that the document CBA.0001.0319.54 be called up, please? Uh, now, Mr Doherty, um, I think you indicated in questions to Mr Donnelly uh, that you have read the statement of Peter Clark prepared on behalf of the bank, is that right? Yes. And have you read the annexures to no. Mr Clark's statement? I see. They were not made available to us. Thank you. So, um, just to um, orient you, this is uh, Exhibit PNC 26 to Mr Clark's statement, and it's a report of 333 Real Estate, September 2011. And can I ask, please, the operator to bring up uh, page 5408? Um, and if you wish to take some time just to read for yourself, Mr Doherty, the bit in the box at the bottom under the heading refinancing proposals, that's where I'm going to yeah. ask you some questions The triple three report that we were given is different to this triple three report. Okay. Can, can so this is a different document to the one that I've got here. Can I, can I just ask you this? Um, can I ask you please to read that those three paragraphs in the last box next to the words refinancing proposals? And then the question I'm going to ask you is if that was a proposal you recall putting to 333 in September or around September 2011. Who's BABL? Um, All I can come up with is Bendigo Adelaide Bank Limited, Ron, but that's I'm sorry, a guess. C Commissioner, you're absolutely right. Bendigo Adelaide Bank. Okay. Uh, so, Mr Doherty, my question is just if you have a recollection of putting a pro proposal to that effect uh, to 333 or Bankwest? Every proposal we put forward was in writing. Uh, there was no verbal communication of an important thing of that nature. If it's in our writing, we put it through. I couldn't recall on a document which is different to the document that I've been given, just being put in front of me there. Okay. Exact, exact. But there are many options we're exploring with the bank to um, refinance. But as I say, this is not the document the bank gave me. But I'm asking you about the substance of the proposal. Yeah. And as I understand it, your evidence, and tell me if I'm wrong, please, as I understand it, your evidence is that you do not recall putting a proposal of that substance to 333. We, we put bank. many proposals forward to the bank um, of how we could work through the issue. Um, to say that is exactly what's put forward, I would have to relay it back to our correspondence to the bank. Thank you, Mr Doherty. And just one final um, question. Uh, you were asked some questions by Mr Donnelly in relation to the expenses that were left to the Doherty Group 
towards the end of 2012 in order to finish the construction mm -hmm. and open up the hotel. Um, and you indicated, I think, that you, you referred to the liability to the ATO in the sum of about $1.2, $1.3 million, mm -hmm. you call that. Um, now, it's the case, wasn't it, that at that time you also, the Doherty Group also owed ACOR about a million dollars in outstanding fees, is that uh, correct? That ACOR was a break fee. I see. Um, but do you accept that, th that, let me ask you this question, when you say that fee, um, do you accept that the fee I outstanding... I thought he said a break fee. Can we work out what he said? It's a break fee. Um, can you explain to the Commissioner, please, if what you mean If we terminated by that? the uh, agreement with ACOR? that they, there would be a break fee payable. I see. Um, and uh, at that time, you also had a liability to Guns, who were the builder or Guns subsidiary, through the arbitration process of about $1.2 million. No, totally wrong. Um, guns, uh, the other way, the, uh, the built Guns were on $5,700 per day liquidated damages for any day after the 10th of December 2010 for the um, construction. So Guns would have owed us somewhere in the vicinity of about $3 million. Now that was an avenue that could have been explored because we were holding a $3 million bond from Guns. However, Guns went into liquidation. The liquidator was also Cordamentha and Cordamentha refused to action on the, on the bond that uh, we were holding. Uh, thank you, Mr Doherty. And the solicitors you retained to act on your your company's behalf in relation to the dispute with guns over defective work mm -hmm. was a firm called Page Seeger. That's is that correct. right? And you retained them personally, is that right? Uh, the company did, yeah. I see. Um, and ultimately, um, you owed, uh, or your companies owed Page Seeger a sum of about $600,000 yes. towards the end of 2012, which was not paid, is that That's right? That's correct, yes. And it was Page Seeger um, who took proceedings to the federal court to have you declared bankrupt? In correct? conjunction with Bankwest. Well, I want to suggest to you that it was Paige Seeger who presented the credit. Uh, no, position. I think if you do further investigation, you'll see there's correspondence where Bankwest and Paige Seeger agreed to do it. Thank you, Mr Doherty. I have no further Thank questions. You. Thank you. Mr Stapleton, is there anything you have? No. Mr Hodge? Uh, Mr Hodge. Mr <laughs> Donnelly, sorry. No, no further questions. If yes. Mr Doherty can be excused. Thank you very much, Mr Doherty. Thank you. You may step down. You're excused. Ah, uh, Mr Donnelly, where now? Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the next witness will be uh, uh, Mr Peter Clark of CBA, and I might invite my learned friend, Ms Collins, to call him. Yes. It's not Ms Collins, Commissioner. Oh, Mr Sherry. Can we, can we have five minutes just to reorganise ourselves? No, it Please. Is it is yeah. It's Dr Collins, Commissioner. Right. Uh, if I come back at... Uh, is it, do sorry, Dr. Collins calling you? Collins is calling. I'm Mr. just an, Clark. I'm not a doctor, actually. I'm not a doctor. So, <laughs> Dr. Higgins is calling. No, no, I am. I am. I'm calling Peter Clark. Someone sorry. on behalf sorry. of CBA I'm will sorry. call the witness, we'll I think. We'll sort out our housekeeping, Commissioner. It's, it's my I fault, Commissioner. I think I, I need to take five minutes, Mr Sherry. <laughs> uh, I'll come back at 10 to 11. 